Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining. My name is Mikey Mahenna. I'm going to be the host for today's conversation. I'm honored to invite our special guest, Iman Abdelhadi, who is Provost Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of Chicago. She studies gender, religion, and Islam. Her qualitative, her quantitative work examines Islam's relationship with Muslim women's outcomes domestically and worldwide. Her qualitative work, including an ongoing dissertation project, is on trajectories through Muslim community, identity, and religiosity among those who grew up in the United States. Welcome, Iman, to Africa Conversations. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I guess a really good place to start is thinking through how you came to this work, um, a little sort of biographical context, what is um, sort of, what's your background and how did you get interested in Muslim communities in the US? Yeah, um, thanks for that question. I'm actually Muslim and Arab myself. Um, so my, I'm uh, half Egyptian, half Palestinian, um, and I grew up between Egypt and um, the US. I spent part of my childhood in Egypt, um, but um, mostly lived in um, mid-Missouri, which um, if you haven't heard of it, um, congratulations. Um, the hub so, for Muslim life in the world, Missouri. <laughs> yeah. Yes, um, yeah, it's a, it's a major, it's a major <laughs> hub, yeah. Uh, all 10 of us there, were, yeah. <laughs> you know. Um, but yeah, so um, I grew up very embedded in a Muslim community, uh, very much very involved uh, in my local um, masjid, uh, mosque, and um, uh, yeah, and was just very interested in this particular community and, and just kind of how like the ways that it straddled um, religious but also ethnic and racial lines in the U.S. Um, and so it became a subject of interest. I started studying uh, like Islamic studies in college, um, realized that there was this whole world of social science um, that, you know, uh, involved studying Muslims. And um, yeah, and then I ended up pursuing a PhD in sociology um, with the idea of sort of studying this community. Um, and yeah, everything kind of un unfurled from there. That makes sense. I mean, before I sort of ask, a few more uh, like biographical questions. I just want to read some of the titles of your papers because um, it helps set the stage a little bit. So some of the, uh, the scholarship that you've written uh, includes reexamining, restructuring, racialization, religious conservatism, and political leanings in contemporary American life. Uh, Losing Women, How Gender Shapes Community Embeddedness Among Second Generation Immigrant American Muslims. Um, you know, do values explain the low employment levels of Muslim women around the, uh, around the world uh, within and between country analysis? The reason why I'm reading these things is because these types of questions aren't questions that we typically ask in Africa, in the Africa sort of universe, um, because sociology is really hard to do and it requires a lot of testing and a lot of work and a lot of roll up your sleeves quantitative analysis. So, my, I have two questions here, and they're very different. The first one is, um, as somebody who grew up in Missouri, where there may not be this like huge Muslim or huge Arab American network, what drew you into understanding the networks and communities across America? That's the first question. And the second question is, what is sociology? Can you just set the table and tell people what sociology is? <laughs> That's a great question. You're basically making me really, um, you know, I'm like, can I explain sociology? Like yeah. that's the, um, otherwise am I in the wrong uh, position? <laughs> so either I will, I will rock this and give a great definition or I'll be, have to rethink my entire life trajectory. So yeah. here goes. Um, but in terms of the first question, yeah, I mean, um, uh, so one of the interesting things is, so I grew up in this small town where the Muslim community was, uh, I grew up in a very religious household and my, um, the community was really focused on Islam as a unifying factor. So there weren't enough Arabs or enough South Asians or enough like um, various groups to break off entirely. So everyone kind of united around the religion question, you know, um, even I think people who otherwise weren't very religious before they moved to this um, town, 
And um, and we know it was also the particular time as was a lot of folks moving to the US at the time of the Islamic revival and sort of just becoming more religious. Um, so I think, um, so I grew up in this town where uh, religiosity was really important, ironically, even though we were such a tiny community, it was also yeah. a very uh, close knit community and a community in which um, everyone was really very aware of each other's behaviors and it was very gendered, um, like the amount of uh, how people sort of expressed religiosity and what got monitored and what didn't. Um, and it was, and then it was actually beautiful, you know, like it was an, an amazing kind of network of like family, um, basically creating this like extended family out of complete strangers. Um, so it had a lot of ups and downs, as you can probably hear from my description. And um, I went off to college uh, in Michigan and Michigan has a very different Muslim and Arab <laughs> community. Um, so a there's you know a huge it's whereas I lived in this tiny town that was two hours away from the from the closest city um, in Michigan there's this interconnected network of of towns and suburbs and um, the Muslim an Arab presence there is huge. Um, and they're not the same thing. There's an Arab presence that's not Muslim. There's a Muslim presence that's not Arab. Like it's all very mixed. And so um, uh, what I found was that I was suddenly in this extremely different type of Muslim community. Um, uh, and I started to get just really curious about what, what does that mean? Like to have these very different types of spaces and how does that affect people's identities um, and people's, um, uh, yeah. And so actually, if you <laughs> look at the bottom of the screen that's being shared, this is my bachelor's thesis. Um, and that was like my first sociological question, right? It was to say yeah. like, Okay, so what is, how is it different if you grew up in Dearborn, which has the highest density of Arabs outside the Middle East, and you're, you're, you know, you are surrounded by other people who either share, who share most of your identities versus a place like Columbia, Missouri, where you're, you know, pretty much on your own and you have this really centralized um, institution that kind of holds your community space. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's that was kind of the beginning of my interest in sociology. Why sociology and what is it um, is a really interesting question. Basically, so, the, the basic premise of sociology, I would say, is that society is more than the sum of its parts, which means that, yeah, which means that we can't, that the social world actually functions um, by its own rules that are not just ag aggregated uh, aggregating individual behaviors and individual outcomes. So, um, so what that means is that, um, what that means is that we can discern things like patterns, right, in this, in, in, in like groups and, and laws, almost like physical laws of like how things happen in society. Uh, and, and basically we can, we can do these big analyses to try to figure out uh, what these kind of basic rules of how we interact with each other are. Um, and um, I think that in terms of, uh, I, I think another key thing in sociology is that a lot of the things that we think of as really individual, as really, really like personal and whatever can actually be really socially um, influenced, right? So something like religion, uh, we think of religion as this deeply kind of like personal thing, right? Wh what I believe, yeah. who am I is, as an individual thing. But if we think about it, right, um, if that were the case, then any, if it were purely an individual thing, uh, then any one of us would have a totally random chance of being in any religious faith, right? Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. But we don't. <laughs> we're like 90 plus percentage of people in the world end up in the religious faith of their parents and of their region and that sort of thing. So these things are patterned. And that's not to say that individual choice and individual agency don't matter, but rather that um, there are patterns that are more than just each individual. Well, that's an example of how uh, we can't just say, okay, it's just a bunch of individuals making choices, right? There's actually aggregated patterns across society. So yeah. that's my crash course in sociology. That's perfect. That's perfect. So I would hear verdicts. Yeah, no, that's perfect. That's fantastic. I mean, um, what I think is one of the sort of uh, 
recurring themes that undergirds your work is this idea of the person to the different institutions, right? Mm -hmm. And the relationship between uh, that person and how their personal identities um, that they either hold um, because of something that's inherent in themselves or the, the relationship to these institutions, how it affects their life out, you know, mm-hmm. just as a member of society. So like you talk about, you talk about employment a lot, right. Um, mm-hmm. And how uh, some of your research looks at how the hijab um, can affect, affect um, which obviously is not only uh, a, a choice related to religion, but it's also just a personal choice of mm-hmm. Um, that uh, women can make in the States, and, but how it can affect all these other real outcomes that have nothing to do with their, their choice. Can you walk through yeah. you know, um, this, this paper in particular, what led you to it, some of the conclusions and some of the research that you might be built in, building on um, with this paper? Yeah, I mean, first, I'd like to say, you know, that the reason we look at women's employment is because we live, you know, we live in a world in which uh, you have to work in order to, usually you have to work in order to survive, right? Um, And um, women's employment is important because, not because I think work is that great, (laughs) you know, work as well, Um, but because, um, you know, work can be its own form of oppression, Um, but uh, we have there has been really consistent evidence that work is uh, has been important in terms of um, creating more gender equal societies like having women's access to work gives them more independent access to wealth um, it gives them you know um, just better life outcomes overall. agency and mobility so, all these things yeah. yeah all of the things and so um, um, so oftentimes we think of employment as a way, as a kind of test case for Mm -hmm. how a society or a group is doing in terms of gender equality. Um, So I started looking at this question of Muslim women's employment and this, um, and um, so there's two things at play here. One is people think of, there's a lot of work that kind of suggests that, okay, Islam, Muslims, there's something weird going on with Muslims and Islam that make it so that um, Muslim women have the worst outcomes um, of, in terms of employment, but in terms of other things, right? So it's sort of like a global Islam effect. Um, and that question of what this Islam effect is, or does it exist, has been kind of animating a lot of this work. So if we think about the U.S., it's a context in which um, the Muslim community is really diverse, right? So we can potentially un disentangle things like ethnicity versus, you know, the sort of culture versus religion question, uh, which, you know, I have, uh, that's, that we could get into separately. But, um, you know, um, so basically what I was curious about here is are, taking this really basic question of employment, this really basic kind of litmus test for how a community is doing, um, how are Muslim women doing, right? Um, Compared to other women in the US. And that's something that we didn't really have data on before, right? So I had to pull surveys from other, from different sources. And, um, you know, at first when you run the numbers, you're like, oh my God, Muslim women are so much less employed than non-Muslim women. So if you look at this table, you can see that like, these are probabilities of women of each faith working, right? So you're saying like 71%, basically a way to think about it is like 71% of um, of every 100 Protestant women, 71 of them are in the labor market compared to of 100 mu- Muslim women, only 56% of them are in the labor market. Yeah. Um, so then you're like, oh, this is actually really high. But then when you break it down by hijab or not hijab, uh, you realize that, wait a minute, the, the non-hijabis have almost as high employment as the, um, as the Protestant and, and, and Catholic women. Um, so then the question becomes, okay, well, why is it that the people who are wearing hijab have lower employment, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm speaking too much, let me know if you want to. No, no, this is perfect. I have, <laughs> okay. I have so many, I have so many um, uh, uh, quantitative questions for you, but keep on going. Cause I, I so want you to finish this. We try to figure that out is to say, okay, well, what are the, some of the other variables that could have affected women's um, 
this issue, right? So is it that, um, for example, you could say, well, it's because hijabis are more religious and more, more religious women are um, less likely to work maybe for ideological reasons, right? So one way to test that would be to look at religiosity among everybody else, because if that were true, then we would say, okay, the more religious women who don't wear hijab should be less employed, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so you throw that in there as a control variable in the model, and basically what I find is that's not really the case, right? First of all, hijabi's religiosity itself varies. So the degree to which we, yes, people who wear hijab are on average more religious than people who don't wear hijab, but um, not the differences are not as big as you would expect, actually, which yeah. indicates that a lot of folks wear hijab for many different reasons, right? So, um, yeah. Before you keep on going, I just want to um, just bring you back for a second to help yeah. um, walk through um, the the hetero heterogeneity of this group of Muslim yeah. women in the states yeah. in terms of ethnicity, in terms of. Um, uh, migration to the states or like uh, de degrees of generations that they've been in the U.S. Um, mm -hmm. The like economic, uh, economic diversity, the geographical diversity. Like, yeah. um, are these, are these, uh, I would imagine that they, this is not a very homogenous group. There's a very heterogeneous group. Yeah. Can you walk through the, the, the ways it is um, diverse? Yeah, so this is a super diverse group. This these this survey is actually, you know, our the kind of the only sort of seen as a representative sample of Muslim Americans in the US. Um, and basically what you have is like in terms of ethnicity, so about 70% of Muslim Americans are foreign born, so born outside of the US. Mm -hmm. uh, another 12% um, are children of people who were foreign born, so a lot of first and second generation immigrants. And the um, so first generation is the immigrant, uh, second generation is their kid. Um, yeah. So I know people use those terms differently. Um, so in terms of ethnicity, about 30% are Arab. Um, uh, and another 30% are South Asian, and then people are kind of mixed all over. Um, about 20% are identify as Black, which of course is not mutually exclusive with Arab. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and um, yeah, so it's an extremely heterogeneous group. There's basically people uh, from all over. Um, in terms of religiosity, we're looking at a group that's basically kind of split almost 50-50 in terms of people being religious or not. Um, how are they, how are they, religiosity? yeah, how are they even defined as Muslim? Yeah, that's an interesting question. That's a very, that's a basic kind of yes or no question that's asked as a okay. screener question when the survey is first. Yeah. So it's like, are there Muslim adults? So there might be people in who get missed by the survey because they simply say no, because maybe they come from a Muslim background, but they don't, you know, believe. So people mm -hmm. define things differently. Although in my other, in my qualitative research, I found that people tend to, um, hold on to at least the label Muslim in a U.S. context, even if they don't, even if they might identify as like atheist or agnostic, um, because yeah, it's such yeah. a racialized label. Like it's not just a religion in the U.S. context. It also kind of has a racial connotation. But yeah. um, uh, what was I saying? Oh, uh, the heterogeneity of the, of the, yeah. So really mixed group, um, in terms of marital status, in terms of age, in terms of employment. Um, yeah, which is great because then we could use those variables to see whether, um, other things might explain, um, well, to see what might explain the, um, the hijab effect, if you will. Yeah. I'm, you know, it's so funny because, when you control for um, when you control for uh, like generations in the states, yeah, um, did you come across any other surprising uh, conclusions or happenings that led to other research? Are is there uh, research for other ethnic groups or other sort of uh, communities uh, that mm -hmm. exist that you were sort of referencing or applying to, um, whether they're religious or you know? ethnic or yeah it's an interesting question i mean in some sense there's so it's it's a hard it's hard right because this is a group that is both a religious group and um has a lot of eth 
ethnic minorities with different like immigrant trajectories or non-immigrant trajectories. Um, so, but, um, and it's hard to compare the, it's really hard to compare most, like, Muslims or like there's it's hard to find an equivalent to hijab in other groups you know because yeah. it's just such a kind of unique um thing um but but um you have high levels of education which is true of many immigrant groups um um yeah but kind of it's it's kind of an isolated in an, a somewhat isolated case uh, okay I'm not sure. cool yeah Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so I want to I want to move on to some of the other research that you've done. Mm-hmm. Um, so this this paper I found really interesting, and this was uh, this paper was focused on this idea of employment, but not only in a U.S. context, but also in a context of um, uh, looking across different countries, right? So, and whether um, this sort of values uh, this idea of religiosity and um, and Islam in general impacted employment levels, right? Mm -hmm. And I don't believe, um, yeah, so maybe you can walk through uh, what this idea was, why why you brought up this idea and what you found. So basically, um, there's a bunch of research that said that finds that um, Muslim women are the least employed women across the the world. Um, So compared to women of other, uh, this is what happens when you're always fidgeting <laughs> with your jewelry. Um, when uh, So across the world, Muslim women are the least employed. And there's quite a bit of research. I mean, there's this really famous book um, that basically makes the argument with very little empirical evidence. Um, it makes the argument that um, the reason that Muslim, that A, Muslim communities are sort of like the only ones lagging, the the ones lagging behind on gender inequality. Um, And that um, the Muslim community or, and that, um, and they use women's employment. Um, And then the other, the, the, the main argument of the book is that this is an ideological problem. This is a problem of ideology that people are basically opting out of the labor market because they're, thinking that I shouldn't be in the labor market because I'm a woman and women belong at home or Mm -hmm. their community holds this view. And so the community keeps them at home. Right. Um, And so I want to contrast for a second, what it means to say that something is an ideological problem compared to maybe a material problem, for example. So a different explanation that would be more material as opposed to ideological might be something like, well, um, uh, Muslim women are more likely to live in economies that rely on, um, uh, for example, I'm, I'm just kind of making this up, right? Uh, on, uh, on blue collar labor and blue collar labor tends to favor men. And so therefore uh, you end up with this kind of uh, disparity, for example. Yeah. Um, so what we wanted to do in this paper is basically assess the ideology question. In the beginning, we were we weren't we also find that Muslim women are the least employed in terms of just raw numbers. If you just look at percentages, um, but what we wanted to do was to say, okay, is it actually about ideology? And the figure that you're seeing is basically this is how you kind of this is how you figure out if one variable in this case, gender egalitarian values, explains the relationship between two other variables, right? So Muslim to employment, right, is a relationship that you just kind of see, but it could be explained by something else, which is, in this case, gender egalitarian values. So we do this with the survey that everybody kind of uses. This survey is really known for having values, uh, value questions, ideological questions. What's the survey? hmm? What's the survey? The World Values Survey. Okay. It has, um, I think in this um, uh, 60, um, this, uh, this, we had like 60,000 observations from 50 some countries. And um, what we find is no matter how you, you cut it, the ideology thing doesn't answer the question. So basically it is not the case. It is absolutely not the case that the reason that Muslim women are less employed 
is because they are more conservative ideologically. It is also not the case that they are not employed because their community is more conservative ideologically. So we measure that by looking at the gender ideology in their surrounding society um, and try to see if it explains what we find. So right? as just to like enter into your brain a little bit, right? Yeah. So you're writing this paper. Are, do you feel like as a sociologist, you have to um, find, uh, you know, explanatory variables in addition to uh, like cutting out explanatory variables? Are you <laughs> somebody who's just like, okay, it's not this. So what the hell is it? <laughs> um, it's funny that you, you're saying that and I see someone in the chat is saying that too. Um, and it's, it's true. It is kind of the like annoying thing about this paper. And actually the first time we sent it out for review, you know, the reviewers were like, okay, okay, cool, cool, cool. But like, what is it? What is it? Why yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and it is a good question. And um, I- Because it would drive me even I more crazy, right? At the end of the day, huh? <laughs> I said it would drive me even more crazy. You know, it's like you see a leak under the fridge and you're like, where is the leak coming from? It's got to be from somewhere. This this question haunts my nightmares. Um, But because I'm a scientist at the end of the day, I will say that the official answer is I don't know. Um, But I can speculate based on various things. Um, One is that I, so the other finding of this paper is we do this kind of, we do this fancy, fancy modeling to try to isolate whether the effects we find are between country or within country. And what that means is uh, between country effects would mean that Muslim countries have less employed women overall than non-Muslim countries, right? A within country effect would mean that within each country, Muslim women are less employed than other than women of other religions. Does that make sense? Um, mm-hmm. And what we find is that actually there's a within country effect and not a between country effect. So it is not the case that Muslim countries necessarily have less employed women. Uh, it's uh, more that... Um, within countries, Muslim women are less employed than other people. And what that suggests to me is um, potentially a discrimination effect. Um, And again, that's really similar, that's kind of similar to the hijab argument in some way, the hijab article, which is focused just on the US, but essentially, you know, in that article, what you find is even after you try to explain it with all these things like different age structures and whatever, there's still this lagging effect that's not explained that seems like it's a sub, what we would call a supply side effect, which is like it's, it's an effect of the actual market that the women are facing. Yeah. Um, so I think there's some discrimination. I think it's probably the case that um, I, I, would, I would think, and I, I don't have the data to test this, I think that the structure of um, in which folks, um, if you follow the kind of rule of man as provider, uh, woman as uh, the sort of his money is our money, her money is her money structure, Mm -hmm. uh, which is, you know, typical in Orthodox Muslim uh, households uh, that can afford it. Um, I think what it may be doing is it offers women an out when the labor market is shitty. Um, Excuse my language. (laughs) Um, But basically what it's saying, what it does is it says, it basically gives with yeah like and the labor market is often crappy right in yeah. most places in the world like the labor market sucks like most people work jobs they hate so um, two two yeah. questions um before we move on to the next uh yeah. the last two things um first is this a long, was this is this data set the survey the the world value survey is this mm-hmm. a longitudinal survey like do you have access to data going back to the 50s or yeah um, um, it's a good question. We didn't end up doing this longitudinally because the problem with the World Value Survey is that they don't sur- they don't uh, ask they don't uh, survey the same countries every year. Mm, and okay. so, basically, if we had looked at it over time, we would have lost too many countries to be able to trace. You know, um, yeah. over, over time. So we decided to focus on one type. But that's a really good question. Potentially something to look at. Okay. Um, and then the last one um, is I'm really curious, and I guess I got to go back and through, look through the paper, but um, yeah. the, what this looks 
looks like in in Southeast Asia and you know like places like Indonesia and Malaysia and Singapore yeah. with like large uh, Singapore is a little different but like I'd be really interested in Singapore's results in general because there's yeah. a, a large Muslim community that's like very Singaporean yeah um, and um, I, anyway so that's uh, yeah. I'm very curious to look into that okay let's talk yeah. uh, briefly <laughs> about your uh, um, what was your dissertation that's coming out as your book mm -hmm. um, around um, this idea of embeddedness, right? Mm -hmm. And um, can you sort of set set the stage a little bit and define the term embeddedness and sure. what that really means when we talk about Muslim communities? Yeah. So um, in the context of the Muslim world, right, um, the question of relationship to Islam might be more about if everyone's around, around you is Muslim, which is not always the case in like, mm -hmm. you know, Arab countries, but in, in Arab countries that have really high percent Muslim, uh, you know, the question is, are you religious or not, right? Yeah. Um, but in a context like America, the question isn't just, are you religious or not? It's also how embedded are you in Muslim communities? And what that means is, who are your friends? Like, who are you hanging out with? Are you hanging out with other Muslims? Or are you actually, do you have sort of like diverse networks and, and such? Um, and what's interesting is that a lot of the books, if you read all the books on Amer American Islam, and actually like so many of them are right behind me right here in my office, um, they're so focused on the people who are super attached to Muslim identity, right? People who are like, all Muslim all the time. Muslim in, 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 institutionally, they're institutionally, inside the institution. yeah. yeah, and in terms of identities. And the reason is that most people will study this by going to a mosque or a Muslim student association and doing ethnographic work in those spaces. And yeah. that's great. And we have really good data on those spaces as a result. But um, the reason I came to this question is because I looked around me and was like, wait, it's not the case that everyone is having this experience, right? As a Muslim American myself, yeah. right? Uh, and it's not the case that people are either in or out. They're, they te it tends to change over the life course. Um, yeah. So that, that was the sort of animating question of this, this project. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, for me, uh, I'm not Muslim, um, but when I studied in the States, uh, um, I remember not being attracted to the Arab student organization yeah. at all and like yeah. really kind of rejecting and feeling allergic um, to that institution. It didn't click with me at all. Yeah. Not for a minute did I stop feeling Arab and stop feeling like, um, yeah, so I would, I would yeah. have been left out of this survey. Um, and you were, and you were going there from, you, from, you, from the Arab you world. had grown up in the U S I mean, in, in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah, I had literally yeah. gotten off of a plane from Beirut and yeah. was like, oh, I'm definitely not going to organize yeah. with those students of Arab descent, even though I'm an Arab student here, you know? Yeah. Well, I'm curious, too, because, well, so I think a lot of that is about diaspora, too, right? Like, you might be more stable in your Arab identity having grown up in the Middle East, right, um, than someone who grew up in the U.S. Well, I think a, a part of it is that... Um, a part of that is that it's just like when you're a child, you have a really simplistic view of what identity looks like. And yeah. you're like, oh, you guys make Nukhiya different than me, right? <laughs> totally. And this is not my thing. This doesn't fit with me. Um, yeah. And so like that great being a sort of- dividing line. Yeah, right? And so um, all of a sudden you're like, this doesn't actually uh, resonate with me. Not only does it not resonate with me, there's cognitive dissonance. And I don't like how this makes me feel about a lot of different things. Yeah, it's destabilizing to your it's own. It's destabilizing, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah precisely. Yeah. Um, so I'm curious, this actually brings me back to the, the question I felt I wanted to ask you when you were talking about going to Dearborn. Yeah. So when you went to Dearborn, uh, when you went to Michigan rather, and you were yeah. like close to Dearborn and close to sort of the Arab American community there. Yeah. Um, what sort of reflection did that give you when you thought about the the Muslim network that you were a part of, albeit one with ten people in Missouri, but like, mm -hmm. is did those uh, you know because smaller smaller communities end up being tighter, yeah. Bigger communities you can sort of become uh, be become disparate and sort of or become just, looser. Yeah. The title of this book is "Losing Women." Yeah. Did you feel like you could be lost in in Michigan in a way that you couldn't in Missouri? Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because in, yeah, um, 
I think my initial reactions were just, whoa, <laughs> there are so many Arabs. I didn't know we were allowed to exist here in this way. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I remember like just freaking out at seeing like Arabi written on the signs, you know, and I was just like, what? Um, but yeah, I think um, realizing that there is a version of growing up in America where your identity is not so high stakes, where it's not so all encompassing the way it was for us growing up in Missouri, mm. where it was just like, it was the thing that everyone knew about you. Um, and so, and I mean, especially for me, cause I grew up wearing hijab. And so I, you know, I just like was the Muslim kid, you know, but there was all other Muslim kids too, but it's like, we were all Muslim first all the time. Right. Yeah. Um, because that was just so visible. Whereas um, in Dearborn, that's not really the case. But what I fi end up finding in this, in this dissertation and in, in this book what, um, is that, um, people are lost much further along <laughs> than, um, than initially, right? So people basically are, you know, immigrants tend to find other immigrants, they tend to find other immigrants that are of their ethnicity and of their religion and they hang out with them. And so a lot of kids, these second generation kids grow up pretty embedded in Muslim communities, like pretty yeah. much hanging out with other Muslims a lot, um, having their social lives revolve around other Muslims. And, um, what ends up happening is the type of community you're in, whether you're in a Columbia, Missouri or a Dearborn, Michigan, affects the type of um, embeddedness that you have, uh, especially early on. But most people are in neither of those situations. Most yeah. people are in neither an enclave like Dearborn and or a tiny town like Columbia. Most people are in town, are sort of kind of spread, right? Like they're yeah there's some Muslim community, you could dip into it, or you could dip out, you know, and usually it's not enough to hold you in place, right? It's not, the community is not thick enough to meet all of your needs. And so most people end up experimenting with other identities in their adolescence and in their early adulthoods, simply because there's just not that much going on at the Meshed, right? Yeah. Like, um, in, in fact, a place like Colombia is better at keeping you Muslim because yeah. so much, A, you're super visible to everybody else, and B, you are, the masjid becomes your, like, everything, right? It's like, it's, it has the basketball court, it has the restaurant, it has the, like, everything is there, and so you're always hanging out there. But in most communities, that's not the case. Um, yeah. What ends up happening, though, is that as people experiment, the community and parents react extremely differently based on the gender of the person experimenting, yeah. right? So when men experiment, they're kind of given this like, don't ask, don't tell, like, just do you, try not to be too open about it, you know, like, yeah. um, boys will be boys type of thing. Whereas when women experiment, there's an intensive and very immediate reaction of like trying to monitor their behavior and trying to figure out where they're going, what they're doing, who they're doing it with, and to try to control that. And so it creates this conflict with Muslim identity for women, where it becomes this high stakes situation where they're trying to distance um, where they're trying to distance themselves just to get a little bit of autonomy. It's usually not an ideological split. It's not a like, I hate Islam, or, you know, I hate being Arab, or I hate, you know, it's just like, dude, like my dad's calling me every 10 minutes and I'm over it. So I'm going to go yeah. to college far away. Like, you know, it's like an operational uh, challenge. It's not like a philosophical one. It's an operational. No, it's, it's not a philosophical challenge for <laughs> most people. Yeah, It's just like, literally like, I need to get out of here, like, you yeah. know, so I can see my friends and go yeah. to prom or whatever, you know? Um, and so, but what ends up happening is that spaces, Muslim spaces are structured around this gender inequality in a certain way, right? So it's really hard for a woman who isn't wearing hijab and hasn't prepped to just drop into the masjid, but men can do that anytime, right? Yeah. Um, and so men end up over time doing this kind of like halfway in, halfway out thing where they never have to decide. And then when they're ready to sort of adult they want to settle down and they kind of have these undisturbed images from their childhood of like, you know, they never really had to question what the values that they grew up with and the types of households they grew up with. So they're just like, when they're ready to settle down, they're trying to regenerate those households in a way. Yeah. Whereas because women have these conflicts, they start to question that initial yeah. 
um, start and they're like, well, that's not going to work for me. And so that's how community loses women, essentially. I would imagine it's also losing like non-heterosexual men as well for the same reason. Sure, yeah. Um, So this is my qualitative work. I I did these in-depth interviews with 70 folks who were randomly selected. Um, But uh, so I don't have a lot of queer folks in my study, but I did have a few. And yes, they struggled as well. Um, So I'm really curious. uh, I want to get to our sort of like cute Q&A. Um, yeah, sure. but I want to just mention your work around uh, oh, yeah. political leanings in contemporary America, uh, because I think particularly there's an election in a few weeks yeah. um, and thinking through how, you know, America is a very religious country. Um, and so thinking through the sort of religious undertones of each, each religious group and how that impacts um, impacts uh, each community's political leanings is really interesting. Um, yeah. So I just want to mention that here, just in case somebody has a question. If no one has a question about this, I'll come back to it at the end. But in the meantime, let's do our little quick Q&A. Um, yeah. And I'll try to keep you uh, short answers as much as possible, just so we can have time at the end. Um, okay, so what are you reading or watching right now? So I'm really into Audible um, mm. because I get to listen to things on double speed and it makes me feel efficient. Oh, I listen on double speed too. <laughs> yeah, it's so great. I love it so much. Um, and I've been listening to this book that I would never have read, which because it's so long, uh, which is The Power Broker. It's a biography. The of Robert Carroll. Moses. Yeah, Robert Moses. Yeah, so he was a big builder in New York City. It's partially- yeah. It's written by Robert Carroll though, right? Robert Carroll, exactly, yeah. yeah. It's written by Robert Caro about Robert Moses, yeah. Um, so I've been listening to it and it's really good. I find it riveting, yeah. Yeah, amazing. I was, I was recommending this to my dad, who's on the call actually, but uh, oh. my dad uh, not too long ago. Um, okay, who would you love to shadow for a day past or present? Yeah, um, definitely no academics because I already know their life. <laughs> um, I would probably <laughs> shadow um, Bernie Sanders because I'm a Bernie. I love him. So let me ask you a question. Follow up to that. Yeah. In what year? <laughs> that's an excellent. That's an excellent question. You know what? I would follow him. Not now. Um, I would follow him earlier this year, pre-pandemic, when for. A few short weeks, some of us held the hopes that he would win mm. the candidacy. Okay. Um, that would have been fun. Okay, great. Perfect answer. Um, what do people most misunderstand about your work or your line of work? Yeah. Um, well, I think a lot of people are suspicious of social scientists, and I think that's uh, for good reason. I think social science has had terrible relationships with people with like certain communities for a long time. Uh, I think what people don't understand is that just because, you know, it's about the method, not the entire, you don't need to throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? So you, you can be critical of social science without throwing out the entire enterprise um, because then you take away a lot of power from our community to just know ourselves in a scientific way. Mm -hmm. So that's my rant. That's my soapbox. That's great. I think I think sociology is deep. Sociology and anthropology are unbelievably misunderstood. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, whose work do you admire or are inspired by? Um, uh, whose work do I admire or are inspired by? Um, I'm inspired by folks who are able to um, do the academic thing, but also do the public intellectual thing. People like... Mm. Cornell West, um, uh, recently Kianga Yamata Taylor, I love. Um, she's been um, she's been doing her thing. She's a professor at Princeton. Yeah, people who are able to translate um, their academic work into public knowledge and uh, public action. That's my that's my left goal. For real. Yeah, it's a tough um, one. Okay, great. So let's open up to the questions. The first question comes from, I'm going to try to say the name correctly, Amatunur. Amatunur. Um, if you can unmute yourself and ask your question. 
Hi, thank you so much, Iman, for the wonderful talk and for Africa for hosting this. Um, my question to you is, how do you measure levels of religiosity in your research? Um, you mentioned asking if people were Muslim, it was more of a yes or no question. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm wondering, like, how do you measure the levels of religiosity between people? Yeah, that's a great question. So in the survey data that I've used for several of these, um, it's uh, a, a number of things. So mosque attendance can be one, um, but of course that's very gendered. Um, uh, so usually we combine it with multiple things. So mosque attendance, uh, prayer frequency. So people are asked, how often do you pray? Um, people are asked, how important is religion in your life? Um, so very important, not important, etc. It's usually on a scale. Um, so I think those are the main religiosity survey questions. And then in my own, um, in my qualitative work where I'm asking the questions, I um, try to actually keep it really open-ended um, to try to keep, to allow for people's own definitions to come through. So, um, you know, I ask really open-ended things like what's your relationship with religion? And usually people will kind of fill in, you know, some people will say, oh, I'm, I'm praying, I'm, you know, I pray five times a day and I go to the meshes and I fast and all these things. Um, whereas other people will say, well, you know, for me, Islam is an ethical network, is an ethical framework. Uh, other people will say, well, it's just an ethnic identity. I actually don't believe in any of it. Um, and so I, I try to keep, keep it open. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, I am Hanna. This is my dad. I am. So I don't know. Um, so I will ask his questions for him. I don't know okay. why he's not unmuting. So he's asking, uh, as an actuary, he's asking very data focused questions. Um, so what are the sample sizes? And um, did you get a sense that some of your studies are um, changing over time? Yeah, so- um, oh, And then he also said, did you count non-seekers, non not non-job seekers as unemployed? Yeah. Um, so all good questions. Um, in the sample sizes, so I use, for the survey data, I use 2007, 2011, and 2017 data. And um, actually the hijab paper, I think was just 2007, 2011. Um, and um, the sample size for each year is about 1,050, 1,100-ish 1, okay. uh, for the whole Muslim uh, community. Uh, for, yeah, the whole Muslim sample. Um, uh, do things change over time? Um, because these surveys are on, have only been conducted from 2007, like there's not a lot of change in terms of yeah. employment patterns I haven't seen. Um, but um, some opinion things have changed. One interesting thing that's changed really drastically is Muslim Americans views on homosexuality. So in mm -hmm. 2007, uh, about, uh, about, let's see, I'm not 100% sure, but I think about 40% say that it's a question of should society encourage homosexuality or should it be discouraged or should it should society accept it or should it be discouraged? And um, in 2007, it's like 40%. And by um, uh, by 2017, it's like 65%. So there's a ma major change also in the American public and the, but Muslim Americans are sort of in lockstep with it. Um, yeah. But so, that, sorry, that was tangential. I just think it's- No, that's great. Um, um, yeah. Okay, so we have three questions left. We have uh, Dina, Diana, and then Badr. Dina, do you want to unmute yourself? So I am really interested in this concept of losing women. And I thought um, it would, you know, if you could speak to what it might take for women to stay within, embedded within Muslim communities, whether that means that the woman herself has to change or the community has to change. Like, if you have any um, ideas or thoughts about that, that would be interesting to hear as well. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I think, um, so two, two types of women, so one type of woman in my study stays and never leaves. And, and that type of woman is usually uh, people who just have such a strong community, like I talked about, a thick community that keeps them in place. And so they just don't 
end up experimenting to begin with. And there's usually men who have the same experience. Um, and those women are not unaware of the gender inequality in the community. They're very aware of it and they're critical of it. But for them, the benefits outweigh the costs, right? Um, a different type of woman ends up, another type of woman ends up coming back. So one, so that would give the answer of like, have a good community, have a community that draws people in and like, you know, gives them a lot to hang on to. In terms of women coming back, um, there are some, there are a minority in my, in my study, but there are some. And what I find basically is that they usually find alternative spaces. Like, so um, third spaces or spaces that like newer kind of institutions that are specifically trying to address this, this problem. Um, are doing a much better job of drawing these women in. Um, and so I think it's a combination, right? So I think it's, it could be that women just decide to kind of overlook it or fight from within. Um, but, it, but I think there is a lot of work being done around creating more inclusive spaces. And I think that work is successful. Yeah. Um, Great. Thanks, Dina. Um, okay, so we have uh, just enough time for Diana and then Badr. Diana, you want to unmute yourself? Hi, Iman. Hi. Uh, so I wanted to ask, as a Muslim woman, do you think uh, being uh, from this background actually helped you, helped you in some ways? Did it give you some privileges, not, or uh, has made you more religious or less religious? It's more like in, in general or? or oh, or no, you personally. Other, for me personally. As a, uh, yeah, as someone who actually studied these things, do you think you are affected the same way? By studying them? Yeah, because you're studying something that you know very like, very well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that um, people opened up to me a lot more because of my background or felt mm. like I would understand um, where they were coming from. I think also presenting as a woman who isn't visibly religious, um, I think people were open to telling me about non-religious things, whereas I sometimes wonder if I like was wearing a hijab and in the interview, would people be more conservative about what they told me? Um, so I think it did help my research, but I think also... Um, it was helpful for me to just like realize that there's a diversity of experiences. My experience is not the only one, but also to see my own experience reflected back in some other women's, right? Mm. Um, and so it helped me actually realize that I can retain parts because I grew up very religious and then kind of moved away from religiosity and have since kind of reclaimed parts of it for myself. Um, and I think it was helpful for me to realize like I'm allowed it's okay if I don't wear hijab, but I am still allowed to read Quran because I enjoy it, you know, or like okay, why not? Okay for me to re relate to my religion um, on my own terms. Okay, cool. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Diana. Okay, Badr, take us home with your final question. Hi, Iman. Thanks for the talk. Um, different cultures across the world, Muslim cultures, have very, yeah. very different practices. So even here in the Gulf, Muslims in Bahrain have very different, or different religious practices than Muslims in Egypt, than Muslims sure. in Syria, than Muslims in Indonesia. It's almost like we've got nothing similar besides the Quran and praying for my God. How does that reflect in your studies, whether yeah. it's women wearing hijab? So in my, I lived in Australia for quite some time and the Egyptian community was a lot more religious and wore a hijab, but the Levant community was a little bit less kind of stuck to there. Also yeah. because they've been there longer, they had more time to kind of integrate themselves within the Australian community, which is completely very non-religious. Yeah. But in, with the, in the US, in my time in San Francisco or California, the communities really stick together because it's almost like a, this is what we have left of where we yeah. come from. So I was just wondering if these, if these different cultures reflect, um, how do they reflect in your studies? I actually think that this very thing, a very important observation, opens up so much space for interesting um, research, right? Because I think what ends up happening, and I find this kind of, I'm working through this in the book, is that these spaces become battlegrounds like these massages, these MSAs become battlegrounds for fights between different types of Islam, right? Um, fights about authenticity, fights about, you know, um, religiosity. And actually on that topic, um, 
uh, Dr. Sherman Jackson uh, wrote a book in 2005 that's been enormously influential about like the kind of the issue of authenticity between immigrant communities and black Muslim communities that um, you know so the fights over authenticity that happen in these spaces are actually really interesting I think did I freeze no I'm still here okay <laughs> um, yeah so um, yeah I, I try to kind of work that through the book or see it you know, try to recognize it when it happens. But I think in many ways there is a sort of homogenizing effect sometimes in the diaspora because people are like so committed to having each other. We're all we have. And so we have to figure out a way, some kind of standard, right? Uh, and I think, um, yeah, there's a feeling of a lot being at stake. Thanks, Badr. Uh, Iman, thank you so much. Uh, this yeah. was really, really fun. Um, so somebody's asking, where can we, can we read your publications? Um, the easiest way that I found them was to go to uh, Google Scholar and find them. You can find them there. Um, also, if you just search Iman's uh, name, you can find her uh, page on University of Chicago, it has her contact details, as well as all her publications, which are all of which are linked, almost all of which are linked. Um, yeah. Iman, this was so much fun. So fun. I, Thank you so much for having me. I will hopefully get to talk to you soon. Yeah, sounds good. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Have a nice day, night, wherever you are.